Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another exciting virtual experience with the Foss Waterway Seaport and Pretty Pretty Tours. I'm your guide this evening, Chris. And it's a new location. Uh, I've moved offices and it is a new time. Normally we broadcast a little later, but because of the unique and special aspect of this particular experience, we've decided to bump things up a little bit. Tonight, we are looking at a collection of boats within the Foss Waterway Seaport that has recently gone up for sale. Now, when you look at the description of this particular virtual experience, you may have noticed that we said originally 13 boats would be for sale. But in fact, after looking at so many different aspects of the collection, we've winnowed that down to Four. So there are four uh, boats that are going to go up for sale tonight. It is members. Members have first access to these boats for the first two weeks, and then it's open to the general public. You can at any time come in and get a membership and then be eligible for that first in line aspect. But tonight I get to introduce you to these boats and then explain a little bit about why these ones are leaving the collection. And what it really comes down to is that the core mission of the Foss Waterway Seaport is to retain and showcase uh, wooden craft prim primarily that have a history in this area. Either they were used historically in the Tacoma region or they were built by someone important to the history out here. And there's no shortage of boat builders and shipwrights in the area. So when you're assessing a collection like that, there's quite a bit. But over the years, this particular institution has suddenly gathered just a few boats that while they're not important to Tacoma's history, they do still have a history of their own. But they are here now and we are looking to sort of free up some more space to really make way for the collection that's important to the Tacoma story. Tonight, while I do love to give you guys all the history that I possibly can, we do get to lean really heavily on a local expert, Mr. Keith Cameron, who has been with the Foss Waterway Seaport Boat Shop as a volunteer for 25 years. And Keith is not just an accomplished woodworker and boat builder, but he is a distinguished source of information. And I got to just tour around the museum with him and kind of hear what boats were going up for sale, what makes them unique, what he would suggest to, to do if you are going to pick one of them up. And then because I had him there and a camera, I asked him about a few of the boats in the area there that are not for sale. So you are going to get to hear not just about the, the history of the Tacoma area tonight and to see some boats that are going up for sale, but because I can't help myself, we are also going to get to see some boats that are not for sale, but are uh, a beautiful asset to the collection down there at the seaport. And some that I just wanted to talk about because I think they're freaking gorgeous. So as always, if you guys have questions, comments, please let me know. I am following along. Oh, thank you, Allison. It is a nice new space, trying to curate that digital environment. So you guys just let me know what you want to see, what you're interested in, but we are going to take you through tonight. And if you're, if you're new here, and even if you're not, I think it's important just to kind of talk about Tacoma as a, as a maritime powerhouse, right? Because we have been a, a shipbuilding destination for a long time. And so many um, boat shops and shipyards have been in the area here. And it's funny to me uh, as a tourism guy is that I see all these people coming through Tacoma frequently. And the one aspect that they seem to overlook all the time is the waterfront. And with the fifth largest port in the nation, all this maritime history, complete access, all around the Tacoma area to water, it blows my mind that that's a thing. So we're gonna we're gonna try and help people remember just how maritime Tacoma can be. So this is actually a a print of the Tacoma Boat Building uh, Enterprise, and this is back when they were building wooden hold ships and boats back in the 70s. I think this particular one's from 1973, uh, and you can see just the space, but also the really complex ingenuity and beauty of the ships and the boats that were coming out of this area here. Uh, here's another wooden boat that was under construction. And this was at Puget Sound Boat Building Company. Uh, and what I love about this one is you get to see 
just the the artisanship and the craftsmanship that goes into creating a wooden boat like this. Now, this next one, while not from Tacoma exactly, it's our not too distant neighbor down there in DuPont. This is from 1957. And this one delights me, right? Because 1957, they are still following the practice of offloading directly from a train car onto a vessel. Now, while this one is rigged to sail, it is also a motor vessel. Uh, so they could do both. And I, oh man, if I'm not mistaken, this is actually the MV DuPont from the 1950s. And what they're doing here is they bring this uh, boxcar train right up to the waterfront here and then offload cargo into the boat the exact same way that they used to at what is now the Fosswater Seaport building, uh, rails to sails, right? And each of these boxes is a 50 pound box of dynamite which for those of you who have been following along for a while here, uh, the, the DuPont area in particular was really big in the production of dynamite, especially for the US military, uh, which is all due to the fact that Ray Gamble, a amateur magician and full-time millionaire, gave them the opportunity, the, the secret sauce, if you will, of using sawdust essentially to stabilize dynamite so much rich incredible texture to this area and it's all interwoven and that's what i think is so cool about tonight's experience really uh, is that yeah we're looking at uh both wooden boats that are important to the history to the area here but also wooden boats that we're making we're making way with uh that are not as important to the history of the tacoma area but still have a history themselves and that sometimes those connection points overlap. So we get to talk a little bit about that. This one here, while not a traditional wooden boat, had several wooden elements to it. Uh, and this is a Libby boat. Uh, it had a primarily wooden hull and then uh, was constructed out in the area here by um, Birch Birchfield Boiler uh, and Boat Shipping Industry in Tacoma. And they were operational through here, I think like the 1950s and 60s. So that's a little bit more of the like industrial aspect of boat building and shipping out here. What the seaport generally focuses on is a little bit more of that really beautiful boat building, that uh, fine artisanship and the like just genuine pleasure craft. Boats built almost exclusively for the purpose of being beautiful, as well as uh, hardworking vessels that were a little bit smaller. You don't really get to see anything in the seaport that's part of that larger maritime industry. Just because frankly, you can't fit one inside the building. So the ones that we're, we're gonna get to look at tonight, uh, I did ask about these canoes because they are absolutely some of my favorite um, boats inside the seaport. Uh, and we are gonna look at a, a boat like this one tonight, which is going to be up for sale and how they're all connected to just the shipping and maritime industry in Tacoma. And if you don't recognize this, this is a, a 1919 view of Babair Brothers Shipyards. And this was originally located in a five acre plot in what is Old Town, Tacoma today. They're one of like the pioneering shipbuilders of the area. And it was a couple of brothers who were Croatian, like so many of the maritime industry here in Tacoma, Croatian, Norwegians, uh, Greek, all really came to the area and continued that seafaring tradition here. And in 1918, the plant was super busy. Uh, and then eventually they moved on actually to constructing wooden boats for the US military. And uh, they, they were primarily a fishing industry, fishing just right off the coast of Tacoma, uh, coming back home with their fleets. I know that the Gig Harbor uh, Museum has some fantastic stuff on the fishing and maritime industry here in the area. And then uh, they end up moving over to the main shipyard area uh, in Port of Tacoma area right now. And in fact, um, th they were part of that whole enterprise of people that ended up getting the Navy E award, which if you're not familiar with the, the E award, it was a prestigious award given to less than 5% of the shipbuilding 
operations in the United States. And you had this big ceremony where you got a pennant. Uh, and I believe each of the employees had a little pin as well. And it essentially just established the fact that you were doing supreme, absolutely superlative work uh, for the U.S. military at the time. And this particular photograph is from the Tacoma Boat Building Plant in 1942 as they were presented with their E Award by the Navy. So there is, like I said, a rich and palpable maritime history to the area here. And I want that to always be at the forefront of everyone's minds. So now that we've kind of talked about, about the, the actual maritime history of Tacoma, just in brief, let me introduce you to the boats that are going to be, I don't want to say leaving us, because I'd like to believe that they are now going to get woven into Tacoma's history. They were part of a different region's history. They found themselves at the seaport, maybe by chance, maybe by destiny, and now have the opportunity to be purchased and hopefully used here in the Tacoma area again, or in some cases for the first time. So the first one that we get to introduce you tonight is a red kit boat. Uh, and again, the way that this works is that the boats will be made available to members only beginning Friday, tomorrow, uh, and then to the general public starting Friday, March 4th. Uh, boats can be viewed during regular museum hours. That's Thursday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and again, if you want to just go in and get a membership so that you have early access to these, that is uh, also that's something that you can do. Uh, there won't be any haggling on it or any competitive bidding. Prices are as posted. And then interested buyers, all you are required to do is complete an attached form that you can pick up at the seaport, uh, along with a non-refundable $100 deposit. You can use cash, check, credit, debit, whatever you want. Uh, and then the balance owed has to be paid when the boat is picked up and you will come and pick it up from the seaport. Uh, I guess in, in addition to that, all sales are final which I think you should know. But this one is one that I'm really, uh, really intrigued by. It's this little red kit boat here. And to tell you a little bit more about it, I'm very pleased to let uh, Mr. Cameron tell you some more. Here again, this is one of these boats that showed up one day and here it is. Uh, this is interesting because I don't know who the builder is, but whoever he was, he was a good craftsman because this is well built, well done. And this turns out happens to be a kit. And he obviously bought the kit and put it together. And uh, it's built very similar to the way a canoe is. As you can see in here, you've got your frames coming across and your cedar planking. And the, the frames, the cedar planking, are what we call clinch nailed together is how they're fastened and then after he'd done that and smoothed it he put canvas over the outside or I don't know because not having it could be a cloth he could have put cloth fiber cloth on it I don't know this is an excellent condition this is a real somebody wants a, 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 a dinghy for their for their motor launch or whatever so, or sailboat this would be an excellent boat for somebody it's about uh, roughly nine foot long uh, it's all uh, either uh, copper, copper nails or bronze fastenings. The man knew what he was doing. Of all the fasteners, what you do not want to put in a boat is brass. Brass does not like salt water. It'll corrode away faster than anything else. Galvanized or steel, which have, a, have been galvanized coating, they are usually good for Oh, 10 to 20 years, depending upon how you use your boat. The ideal fastener is, well, I won't say the ideal. The best fastener to use is a bronze, silicon bronze, screws or rivets are the types to use. Which does not, which is not made anymore, is a, is a, is a high nickel content steel called Monel. That is the ideal fasteners, but you can't get them anywhere because nobody's making it. There is just isn't a demand. <laughs> One of my favorite parts about walking around with Keith that day was just getting to hear like the chemistry of wooden boats 
And you'll hear a little bit more about that. But one of his big recommendations for any of these boats was to just take it out to the water and sink it. Uh, and I don't want to steal Keith's thunder, but he'll explain a little bit more about that. But also uh, the materials used for fasteners, he had a wealth of information about. And this is a guy who knows his stuff. Uh, he has, like I said, been volunteering just at the seaport for the last 25 years, but that's not the first time uh, his love and passion for boat building and woodworking ever came into play. He's been out there working in this industry for a long time. Uh, but with 25 years at the seaport, he has become, in my opinion, certainly one of the most knowledgeable people down there on the floor, especially about the particular boats that they have in the collection right now. And so some of the ones that are, are coming up for sale today, like this red kit boat, he knew a lot about, but when they had been sort of donated to the museum, they weren't really brought in as artifacts, more just as something that was being held in that space. And as the seaport tries to make way for curated artifacts, we had to look at a few of those there. So uh, that's, that's the red kit boat right there. It is um, being offered up for $1,800 and it is exquisite. It has this beautiful wood all throughout. And of the boats we looked at, I think it was the one that was in the absolute best condition. Uh, you can see the, the wood, the varnish, the fasteners, everything was great. And so you could really just take this out, I believe right away and put it in the water. Uh, I, I, maybe for legal purposes, I'm required to say it. that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that the boats don't come with any guarantee from the seaport itself. Uh, they're on the chat, so you can always ask them yourselves. But for my point, as a licensed sea captain, as someone who's been out there, I would say I would feel confident putting this in the water. I don't know if I'd immediately run the 7048 with it, but I, I also might. I'm not putting it out there. And what I think that was so cool about this one was it was one of a series of kit boats and I wasn't able to track down which kit or company it came from. You would have seen a lot of these, like these are obviously larger motor vessels, but this is from the Sears catalog. Uh, around the same time, you would have seen a lot of like boats like this where just like a, a, um, a manufactured home or something like that, you could just order a kit it would show up with all the pieces, things labeled slot A to slot B, and that you would put it together yourself. As Keith said, this was probably not someone's first time unless they just happened to be cream of the crop. Uh, so this is a well-built, well-established red dinghy, and it is currently up for offer. So for those of you who are looking for a new boat to your collection, that's, that's one of our high recommendations. Leading into my next point of the Great Yellow Canoe. Now, this is the one where I think if I were eligible, I would certainly be interested in. Um, this canoe is one that I've been looking at for a while inside the seaport. If you walk immediately into the building, it has been hanging up on the left for a while there. Uh, and I'll let Keith tell you a little bit about this one. This is a traditionally built canoe. This is the way canoes were built for, for centuries, like this. Cedar planking, that's uh, your framing and your strips going across wide. Cedar planking through and they're nailed together. And then the whole thing's covered with canvas. So this canoe is in great shape with the exception that the paint on the canvas has dried out and cracked. And it needs to either, well, either the paint needs to be stripped off and repainted or the canvas needs to be removed and new canvas put on. If I was gonna own it, I would take it down and see about if I could strip the paint off, heat it up and scrape it off. If that didn't work, then, then I would pull the outside, the rub rail or the fender rail, whatever you wanna call it on the out, pull it loose. That exposes the edge of canvas and you just rip the canvas off and then lay new can canvas over. You know, you put it on and you wet it down set it down with wet paint again, and then you staple around the edges, pull it tight. Before I get into the canoe, we had a really good question about the red kit boat and what year was it built? The official textbook answer is, we don't know. 
But uh, Keith's best estimate was the mid 80s. He thinks that that was assembled by someone in the mid 80s, um, but no idea specifically where the kit came from, unfortunately. Uh, so it could be a little bit later kit, but for unofficial purposes, we'll say the, the mid 80s. It's probably about a late 30s boat. Not built in the late 30s. It's in its late 30s now just like me. Uh, so the yellow canoe uh, is one where Keith gave it a pass of flying colors. The thing that he thought really needed to be worked on though was that exterior. And based on research of similar canoes in the area, uh, in particular like this, this Old Town one, really there's just been some fading of the paint color uh, and the paint on the canvas is what needs some work. The canvas itself was in incredible condition as well as the interior of the canoe, which you can see here is not only gorgeous wood, but was really in prime condition. And so this one really just needs uh, some love to the exterior, a little bit of um, TLC on that end. You can see this is not the canoe that we're talking about today, but I brought up one for a reference. This is a canoe that has had the paint on the canvas deteriorate to a much greater degree. And this is one that you'd really probably want to heat up uh, and remove the paint and then start over again. But our particular yellow canoe in the seaport today, uh, really, really solid condition. Just gonna need a little love on the exterior there and 1500, uh, 16 feet long. And that's, that's what we're looking at for that one. So let me know if you've got questions about that. But let me introduce you now to one of the ones that I was really intrigued by. There is a Canadian lifeboat uh, that found its way into the Seaport collection. It has no connection to the area whatsoever. It's not representative of any kind of lifeboat that was really out here, but it was on a Canadian tugboat. Uh, and Keith has quite a bit of information about that. And uh, as a, a Canadian himself back in the day, uh, I'll, I'll let his accent take it away. So this came, uh, this uh, was originally built in Canada in the early 1900s. Uh, I think after World War I, so it be the 1920s. And it was built as a lifeboat for a coastal tugboat. As you can see, it has the flotation tanks that go in the bottom. Uh, we got it, we had to replace some of the planks on one side were busted and we had to replace, they're on the other side there. And we had to put in new breast hooks, which are what these are. And uh, we got some knees yet, uh, some thwart knees. These knees here need to be put in and fitted but uh, yeah it's uh, not much to say it's very traditional clinker built where the planks overlap one another that's what gives this his lip because they're actually fastened through to one another it uh, main propulsion was rowing because it was uh, meant as a lifeboat uh, it would have, you know, like bailing gear in it and, and uh, it would have emergency supplies in it would be kept in it, as well as a, two sets of oars, whatever would want it. They could use it every, however they wanted. This would be, uh, probably put this in the water and again, it would fill up with water because it needs, the wood's dried out and needs, the wood needs to swell up again to close the seams. Uh, but see, with those flotation tanks, this thing would only sink to about there. So if you got swamped, that's what they would tell you. It would never sink to the bottom. It would always be floating. You could bail it out. I love that one because it strikes me as like the, the beginner car that you get when you're first learning to drive. The one where your parents are like, you can burn the clutch out on that. Like this bad boy is bomb proof. Uh, not only clinker built, but really designed to withstand a great deal of damage and pressure while holding quite a few people uh, and built for the dire moments in life. 
Also, the addition of the float tanks is a pretty cool thing because you really can't sink it. Uh, it can get entirely filled with water and you still have the opportunity to bail yourself out. While it's not going to win any like speedboat competitions, I wouldn't want to smuggle rum with it. It is a beautiful, uh, beautiful boat. And uh, like I said, nigh on indestructible, really nice uh, craftsmanship to the carpentry there. Now, one of the things that Keith mentioned about it is that to make it seaworthy again, you just have to put it under the ocean. Uh, his advice for so many boats would be to just sink them, uh, tie it up, make sure that it's submerged in salt water for about three days. And then when you pull it up and pump it out, that salt water will have caused the wood to swell back up and preserve the boat, making it seaworthy again which you would think is a little ironic that to make something not sink, you have to sink it first. But in fact, that is his absolute best advice for so many of these wooden boats and that you would see a huge rejuvenation of it. Very Game of Thrones. That which is drowned can never die. Uh, but when you're looking at this bad boy here, it is quite large. Uh, his other recommendation was that you would want like a flatbed trailer to pull this bad boy out when you pick it up from the seaport uh, because it is sturdy, which means heavy. And what I love is I tried to find uh, similar lifeboats from the same region and time period to kind of give you some action shots, if you will. Uh, and a lot of them were of like horse carriages pulling these suckers in or out of the water. But look at that. That schooner is going under and the lifeboat remains sturdy, so much so that it was captured in someone's imagination for all time. Uh, so unless you've got a team of eight people and a, a wagon, our best recommendation is that you show up with a flatbed uh, and then claim this beautiful Canadian lifeboat for yourself. Uh, again, offers start uh, to members only. Uh, $1,000 is what they're looking for for this 15-foot Canadian lifeboat, which if you're looking at the numbers so far, that is exactly one foot shorter than the yellow canoe, but can hold approximately, my best guess, 20 more people than your canoe. Whew. Swanky. So let's, uh, let's take a look here. There is one other boat that is for sale. It is the Thompson Brothers boat. Uh, and this one was was really a mystery for everyone involved. Uh, it showed up to the seaport, and while there is a great deal known about the builders of this particular boat, or I guess boats, uh, this one in particular uh, has had its history sort of neglected to be recorded around here. So I'm going to let uh, Keith tell you a little bit about this boat, and then I'll inform you guys sort of about the illustrious legacy of the Thompson Brothers Boat Manufacturing Company. So this was built by Thompson Brothers. So this boat is, again, a strip built. Uh, and uh, the frames, that these are the frames in here, are again are clinch nailed with copper nails. And this was built, uh, well, I should say, was built in Wisconsin. And uh, the owner, he when he passed on, we're going back eight years ago now. When he passed away, his daughter obviously inherited this, and he he lived in Michigan, and he used this on the Great Lakes. So his daughter put it up for sale, and our previous CEO that we had took a liking to it, so he bought it and brought it in here. So it has no history to this area here, you know, and it wasn't built here, so I would I would uh, take it and uh, strip this down to bare wood and give it a coat of epoxy and then lay some light lights, like uh, maybe three or four, four ounce cloth over it. Also the, uh, the guard rail or, or rub strips, which is this, piece of wood here should be replaced because it's there's a section where they're, they're torn out here so it needs some work now I I think I wouldn't put it if you put a five horsepower on it that'd be a that'd be an awful lot for this for as far as power but uh, 
it needs to be stripped out on the inside and, and, and uh, re-cleaned and, and redone. So that's a particularly pretty boat, but kind of a diamond in the rough where you would really have to put some TLC into it. Uh, and as you heard Keith mention, uh, he thought putting a five horsepower motor on that would be something that would be advisable. Uh, it does not come with a motor. It's a bring your own motor situation, but uh, it's already got everything set up so that you can mount one on there. And again, this is a little bit more of a project boat. But because of the illustrious maritime heritage in the area, I'm sure there is someone out here who is capable of taking on a project like this. And it is, like I mentioned earlier, a part of the Thompson Brothers legacy. So if you're not familiar with the Thompson Brothers Boat Manufacturing Company, they are one of the more famous boat manufacturers in the United States. Um, out of a place called Peshtigo, Wisconsin, which if I have butchered that, I apologize. I was not familiar with Peshtigo before um, working with the seaport, but uh, it was founded in the early 1900s by a pair of brothers, like, I don't know, every boat building company in the early 1900s was. Uh, and they started with canoes. Canoes were their big sort of money maker that really drew people to the company the same way that the Willits brothers did. But as time went on, they started manufacturing more and more different boats really for uh, pleasure boating and fishermen throughout the area. So you'll see a lot of the uh, Thompson brothers seals on these beautiful wooden boats. This is one of the original canoes from the Thompson bros. Uh, and you can see the same seal here on the, the little runabout boat that we have here in the seaport today. Uh, and this is, um, we're not entirely clear on the year, uh, but fits a lot of the, the similar uh, detachable motorboat lake model specifications that you would see on some of the Thompson Brothers boats. And for the condition that it's in, it's really incredibly sturdy right now. It just is going to need some love and care, especially to bring it back to that true luster that you would expect from a boat of this caliber and quality. Uh, but it is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Keith was not really willing to give me a full answer as to how seaworthy it would be right now. But believe it or not, one of his big answers was soak it in salt water and see, um, which is, yeah, a shameful pun. Uh, this is a, a different Thompson Brothers boat, which I think was really cool just because it had that drop down on the back there so that you could get ashore a little easier. I just thought that was really classy. Not the boat that's currently for sale in the seaport today, but of the same manufacturing company. So those are the four right there. Uh, there's that red kit boat, the yellow canoe, there's the Canadian lifeboat, and uh, the Thompson Bros wooden boat right there. And I ha saw someone ask uh, if the Canadian lifeboat had ever been serviced as uh, a lifeboat. No. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, the tugboat that it was attached to, which we are pretty confident was called the Hard, never never went down. They never had to use the lifeboat for anything other than working out, apparently. So it um, you can make up whatever story you want for it, honestly. But if people check online, you're going to find out no. It didn't actually save anyone's life. Uh, so those are, those are the big four that are out there right now. But like I said, I had Keith around and since he was willing to talk to me about boats in the area i thought you guys might be interested as well and one of the ones that i really wanted to hear about was this uh so this is mary uh she's a a mojean uh a flat iron skiff and let me uh let keith tell you a little bit about it these mojeans this is a this is what we call a, a flat iron skiff uh, this is probably this is a 10 footer this is thereabouts and uh, this is probably the smallest ones that they built uh, the Mojean family were a local boat building shop here in Tacoma on the on our waterfront here uh, they had uh, four generations of uh, of the family participated in that business. 
Uh, most of these were built for uh, summer uh, holiday camps, which were very popular in the 1920s, 30s, on through into the 1950s. And in the 60s, they kind of disappeared. It's good for rowing or, or motoring. That's what most of them were, were used for. We painted this. This was, this was our early color scheme that we painted some, most of our boats back in the, in the ni in, uh, 1990s, late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, and they were based after the basic colors that the uh, Splinter Fleet, most of them were, had, you were using these traditional colors. Yeah, this boat's in good shape. I mean, it would go in the water and would have to crawl. All wooden boats should, should actually go into the water once a year. If I was to have this and where I was going to put it into use, I'd put it in and I'd sink it out in the water, in the salt water. So it would swell up again. Four or five days, and then pump it out, it'll be ready to go. Because this wood has been drying out. And it does not show it on the outside, you can see on the inside, there's a slight crack line there. That crack line is a joint line in the, in the material, in the planking. Oh, you need to put it in the water, fill it with water, with salt water, not fresh water. Fresh water is bad for wooden boats because it creates rot. Salt water essentially pickles the boat, pickles the wood. So that one is not for sale, but it was one of the boats that I really wanted to have Keith talk a little bit more about. Uh, and definitely was the time where he started going for talking about pickling the boats there, which I love. Uh, I love to use as a terminology from here on out. Now, Keith also, also mentioned the splinter fleet or the splinter navy, as it was called. And that was something uh, referred to wooden boats that were built for the U.S. Navy. Uh, and really what happened was, as you saw that um, war effort swell for World War II, a lot of these independent companies in the area that had shipwrights and carpenters who had been building wooden boats like yachts or fishing boats uh, or little pleasure craft like this one down here had a skill set that they could now put into the wartime industry. And one of the benefits of uh, wooden boats built for the Navy was that there was an incredibly fast turnaround. Uh, especially because you already had skilled labor at that point. So you could turn out a, a wooden boat or ship for the U.S. Navy in 60 to 120 days and have it serviceable and ready for action in that time. So you saw a lot more of these, these military ships show up around here. And a huge portion of them actually came from the Tacoma area where people like the, the Mojin family had been established since the late 1800s, early 1900s, and now brought this skill set to the military effort, which is the same reason that you saw that quality craftsmanship when the E award was given to the Tacoma Boat Building Company out here uh, in the Port of Tacoma area. So it was a, a nice homage, a tip of the cap to that time by painting these Mojin boats in that Splinter Fleet color scheme. Uh, there was another Mojin there that I asked him about because I've always wondered why there were two right next to each other that had similar names. And it turns out it's part of the Mojin biblical triage. Uh, there, I forget what the third one, but it's Martha or yeah, Martha and Mary were the first two. So Keith is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Mojin Martha as well. And again, not for sale, but uh, gorgeous. So you can see this has been refurbished. This is another Mojin. This one's a little bit bigger than, than the other one. What can I say? This is, uh, this is the basic boat. And, uh, and here again, we painted in, into colors that we, we used around here that were traditional with what the Splinter Fleet. A lot of the Splinter Fleet ships were, were painted in. These are made out of cedar planks. There's actually two planks here that, that make the sides. Uh, Weight-wise, they'd be compatible, uh, probably within 25 pounds of one another, whether it's, whether it's plywood or it's cedar planking. Yeah, very good boat. We've got boats here that are over 100 years old and the wood's still in great shape. The Mojin family were here from about the, the early, uh, 
well, back in the late 1800s, right on up through to, I think it was about the 1860s, I mean 1960s, excuse me, that they closed down. So they were here for quite a while. So, Allison, you bring up uh, a cool correlation there. The, the flat iron skiffs are unique and are probably very similar to what you saw in that kit being assembled because uh, unlike some more traditional dinghies, you would actually not build these onto a frame. You would form the wood first. So you actually like, uh, I'm, here, here it is. It would be uh, for the non-indoctrinated, the non-innately uh, talented, kind of a frustrating experience because you do have to shape and form that wood to build the flat iron skiffs. And uh, for some, it was a much easier experience, but yeah, it definitely was a different skill set than a lot of boat builders would have been accustomed to. And so you'll see a few of them out there. Uh, I believe Martha and Mary are the two uh, Mojine flat iron skiffs inside the Fosswater Seaport today. I know Lazarus, Thank you, Julia, is the third of the Mojine collection, but I don't know if that's a flat iron one as well. I think it might be a slightly different boat, but I could be mistaken. Uh, but when you're looking at these, they're beautiful. <laughs> um, and they're they're part of that Mojine legacy. So this is a, a tugboat that was built by the Mojine family. Uh, I think in like the early 1930s, that was used for the transportation of, <laughs> you may have guessed, lumber throughout the Puget Sound area here. So this is just off the coast of Tacoma. I'm trying to think if this would be on sort of the Salmon Beach side. And um, like Keith was saying, they've been prominent through four generations in this area since the early 1900s. And then um, there's even a few pictures. So they had a boat building headquarters in Gig Harbor, as well as down on Dock Street. I believe was their other location. And then they had a shop up on 6th of all places. Uh, and this picture is from 1951 in that white building on the right, just past uh, the first for quality uh, sign and the real estate sign just beneath it is the, the Mojin boat shop. You could just barely make out the sign down there. And the Mojins were entrepreneurs through and throughout. Not only were they creating gorgeous little boats like this, uh, but they they had their fingers in a lot of different enterprises. So this is from 1923, and this is Charles Mojine, who is the twin of Richard Mojine. And Charles here uh, worked with coaches, and his brother did did the boats. So uh, I'm trying to think it was. Richard started with uh, Scancy Shipbuilding and Charles, Richard's twin, uh, drove for the Gig Harbor Stage Company. So they were both in transportation. Uh, one was just a little more landlocked than the other. And there was a third brother, William Mojine, who was, I think, the most accomplished of the shipbuilders. And so eventually they all go in together in sort of the Mojine empire uh, and create several of the boats out here, not just little flat iron skiffs like the ones you've seen tonight, but tugboats, really hardworking fishing boats, as well as some of the most beautiful uh, schooners and yachts in the area. If you just Google the Moji name, primarily what you'll encounter are sort of their high grade artistic works, the ones that they did for wealthy clients. But they were they were part of that proud uh, sort of Norwegian legacy of people emigrating to the Tacoma area and then taking that shipbuilding knowledge they'd arrived with and then repurposing it sort of into the American dream. And like I said, Croatian and Norwegian immigrants were a big part of the the fishing maritime and shipbuilding area out here in Tacoma. Uh, just like my uncle, Lars who once put an ad in the paper saying that he had a boat for sale. And I went over to see him because I was like, I don't think he has a boat. And when I talked to him, I was like, what are you talking about? I thought you only had this old truck and a tractor. And he was like, yeah, but they're boat for sale. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I tell you, I'd never do that again, but I'd be lying to you. So <laughs> that's, that's the Mojines in a nutshell. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, uh, again, not for sale, 
but a, a proud part of the Tacoma maritime history and heritage out there. Uh, and yeah, you can see a lot of the uh, marine repair plants as well as boat building shops in the area. Mojin is almost always listed amongst those ones. And look at it. They did incredible work. And that's, you know, this one's not 100 years old, but it still withstood the test of time so well. And while it has been patched up a little bit by the boat shop down there at the Foss Waterway Seaport, the boat itself is just in remarkable condition. Which actually brings me to my point here where I want to introduce you to one of my favorite boats in the area. Again, this one's not for sale either, but this is the uh, Kawe or the Shell. Uh, and I'm excited to let Keith talk to you about this one. One of the boats that are prevalent in this area is a Pulsbo launch. This is a 16 footer. Uh, when we got it, it was just basically the hull, the shell hull. That's hence, that's why we named it the shell. And we finished it out, volunteers finished it out and rebuilt it. The engine was gone through and refurbished. This, all this mahogany was from, from mahogany that we salvaged. That is pre-World War II Honduran mahogany, which you can't get anymore. And uh, yeah, so we finished it out like this with the idea of someday we'd probably sell it. Well, the engine was gone through, was opened up and checked out, new gaskets put in, uh, was test run, and, and uh, it, it, yeah, it's ready to go. It, you might have, we probably got to add the oil and, and uh, you know, hook up the gas tank, so. But yeah, it should start up once we get the basics to it. It's an air-cooled engine, which is very traditional with these boats. Uh, one thing that this has that the uh, most of the others don't have, this has a marine clutch in it, or excuse me, a marine transmission. So you got reverse, neutral, and forward by shifting this gear law here. Well, all wooden boats need to be put in water. They shouldn't be left out. They should be put in, as I say, once a year, should be able to sit in water for several days, just so that the wood doesn't dry out. Uh, this is... This is carval planking, so it's smooth. The planks are, are built on edge. Uh, we put new uh, uh, we put new frames, which are those. Everybody thinks they're ribs, but they're frames. We we replaced all those. Like I said, you know, built the bulkhead, the seats, the and the uh, and this the uh, pilot station. This should be able to be put in the water and and just as I said. Uh, oil and gas for the engine and uh, should be pretty much ready to go. You can tell where my line of questioning had sort of diverted by the end of this whole thing because we started with the boats that were for sale and then at that point I was like, Keith, you got to be honest with me, which of these zombie apocalypse am I going for? Which of these boats is ready to sail? Because I don't have three to four days to soak one in salt water if I need to make my getaway. Uh, so we were looking at the boats that were absolutely ready. That was definitely one of his recommendations, but you'd be surprised how many boats have to be pickled before you can take them out on the water, which <laughs> is incredibly disappointing for my escape plans. Uh, that is just one of the ones that has always caught my eye in there. It is not for sale, but these... <laughs> Uh, because it doesn't have sales. Uh, the last ones that I want Keith to introduce to you guys right now are uh, sail canoes. And while I have mostly focused my career of touring you around the seaport on the Willits Brothers canoes, which are simply sublime, they're just the most exquisite sail canoes in the area. That doesn't mean that they're the only ones and I would hate to let some of the, the other ones not get some limelight. So I asked him about these two sail canoes that have been up at the front of the seaport there. Uh, and sure enough, I did ask him um, if they'd be ready for a getaway. So these canoes were both built by the Island Canoe Company. Uh, the builder was Earl Donan. Uh, he built, uh, built both of them. I'm gonna say they're traditional canoe for this style. This is what they call a cruising canoe. And they're set up for sailing or paddling. 
Uh, they're both in excellent shape, and would you, I wouldn't hesitate to take them out and put them in the water and go for a sail or a paddle. That workmanship is very good on them. There's nothing wrong with them at all. Uh, they've probably been here about a, almost a decade now. Right, it's the wet. Well, they might be some swelling be required, but the way they're built, it's uh, pretty pretty nice. This is carvel rather. Than, yep, it's rather than lap strake. This is lap strake. That one's that one's smooth. This one's bumpy. The planks overlap on this where they're built. They're planked on edge on that. Uh, yeah, these this company. I don't even know whether they're in business anymore or not. Uh, but they knew what they were doing. Uh, there's uh, the craftsmanship is is very good on it. Very very good. So yeah, those are my getaway boats, which I don't know why I've told you this now. It really lowers my chances. So if we look at the the boats that are there at the seaport which are now available for sale or paddle i'm sorry i can't help myself um we have of course the the red kit boat let's see if i can bring the the picture back up of that one for you that's the number one uh one on our agenda tonight so this red kit boat if you're interested uh it's eighteen hundred dollars Absolutely beautiful, seaworthy, ready out the door condition. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the second one is the yellow canoe. That's fifteen hundred, uh, and again, beautiful woodwork inside of it. Uh, honestly, probably ready to be put in the water. But for the distinguished customer, you're going to want to uh, address sort of the the paint on the canvas there. If not immediately, certainly very soon. Uh, the third one is, of course, the Canadian Lifeboat, my particular favorite, uh, just because it looks like an experience. You know, it's rich on the eyes. Uh, you would need to put a little bit of work into it, of course, but you would have an incredibly sturdy, nigh on unsinkable vessel. I'm not going to say completely unsinkable because we all remember how the Titanic worked out, but still very, very good. And for your um, traditional Canadian fire team cosplay, really an essential item. And of course, the Thompson Brothers boat, which is part of a rich maritime legacy out of Wisconsin. You now know the word Peshtigo. And if you're looking for maybe something more of a project, this is definitely one right there. $800 for that one. And if you've tuned in late today, the way that it's working is um, for two weeks until Friday, March 4th, members have first access to these boats. You go down to the Foss Waterway Seaport during normal business hours and you can look at them in person. If you're interested, uh, you, you put down a hundred dollar deposit and this boat can be yours. Uh, from there, after March 4th, the general public has access to it. And if you just can't wait, but you're not a member, go get a membership. And then you too can have access to one of these boats. So let me know if you guys have questions or comments. But from my end, that's that's the heavy lift. I really just let Keith do all the work tonight because he is the man that knows the most about these particular craft. He's been down there for a quarter of a century breathing new life into the tangible history of this area. Uh, and so in closing, I, I wanted to give you a little bit from Keith because we were talking too about, you know, what kind of made the distinction between boats that could go up for sale and boats that should stick around. Uh, and he talked about this one. This is a traditional lap strike uh, 15 footer uh, rowboat. Uh, was built uh, at the Pioneer Boathouse at Point Defiance by Gage Mason Wheeler. It spent most of its life on uh, American Lake. Uh, it's in very good shape. Even the fasteners are in great shape uh, for when it was built pre-World War II. It probably could do with a new paint job on the outside 
or change the color inside, but it's in structurally, it's in very good sound shape. So this is a local, this has a history, local history. And it was built here, and I mean, well, how more could you get? And one of the things we, we required when we were selecting boats to be here was boats that were built in this area, that have a history of being used in this area. You know, we, we never specifically what type or anything, you know. And we, as I say, we wanted a boat that where we knew we had some history to it. And we know what the history is to this. So there you have it, a passionate man describing the exact feel that the seaport has been longing for. And so as they make way for a new generation of boats that have a history to the area that tell the ever intricate and unfolding story of this region, we are parting now with a few boats that while they're incredible, don't really flesh out the narrative that we're trying to tell. So if you would like to fold these into your collection and have them be a new part of Tacoma's story, please let us know. Uh, come on down to the Foss Waterway Seaport and stake your claim. Until then, my friends, thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited to see you in the, the near future. We have a whole assortment of really cool virtual programming coming up, as well as in-person experiences out and around. Make sure you come on down to the Foss Waterway Seaport and join us. Pretty gritty tours out on our various adventures. Until then, though, I wish you all the best and encouraging you to keep on exploring. Thank you.